Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 Listen to the conversation between Denise, who was a college receptionist at a language school, and Vijay, who was a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6 on the form now. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, may I help you? Hello, is this the right place for me to register to study foreign languages? Yes, it is. May I have your name, please? Vijay. My family name is Paresh. Vijay Paresh. OK. Do you have a telephone number? Yeah. 909-2467. Thank you. Now, which language would you like to learn? We offer French, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, I'd like to learn Spanish, please. OK. Our classes are conducted in lots of different places. We have classrooms in the city and here in this building. What's this building called? This is Building A. I work near here, so it would be best for me to study in Building A. What time do you want to come to lessons? They go on for three hours and they start at 10 a.m., 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. I wish I could come to the daytime lessons, but I can't, so 6 p.m., please. That's our most popular time, of course. Uh, have you ever studied Spanish before? No, I haven't. We describe our classes by level and number. Your class is called Elementary 1. OK. When will classes start? Elementary 1 begins... Uh, just a minute. Uh, it begins on August 10. Great. Now look at questions 7 to 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Great. Now, what else do I have to do? Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. OK. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators and you'll see a game shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the game shop and the toilets. Thanks. Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course. <laughs> the travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk by a dietitian who is an expert on diabetes. He will be discussing ways people can reduce their chance of getting this disease. First look at questions 11 to 16.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, I'm Peter Johansson, an accredited practicing dietitian. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the increasing health problem of diabetes, and particularly type 2, or mature onset diabetes, which represents 85 to 90 percent of cases. Type 2 diabetes is said to be a lifestyle disease linked to being overweight, family history of the disease, a sedentary lifestyle, and how old you are. Although you can't change your age or your family, there are things you can do to reduce your risk. One of the reasons why type 2 diabetes is increasing is because more Australians are overweight than ever before, and we are getting heavier. So why are Australians getting fatter? There are a number of theories, but it is probably a combination of moving less and consuming more fat. As a nation, we have considerable room for improvement in our eating and physical activity habits. Healthy eating, in combination with regular physical activity, is vital to maintaining an ideal body weight, preventing future weight gain, and losing weight if you need to. Eating less fat is a sure way to eat fewer calories and still be able to eat satisfying quantities of food. If you are interested in learning more about healthy shopping, learn to read food labels and become a fat detective. Eating plenty of whole grain breads, cereals, fruit and vegetables will provide you with valuable nutrients without too much fat, provided you prepare them using only small quantities of healthier fats, such as olive or canola oil, nuts, seeds, and avocado. Using low-fat dairy products, lean meat and skinless chicken in moderate amounts will also help. Aim for at least a couple of fish meals per week. The companion solution is physical activity. It's about moving your body more through the day to help burn energy, and every little bit counts. For health benefit, you only need to accumulate 30 minutes of moderate physical activity most days, and you can do it in three 10-minute lots. You will have more get up and go after achieving this 30 minutes a day goal, and you don't need any special equipment. Walking, gardening, and housework all count. It's like the ad says, exercise. You only need to take it regularly, not seriously. Now look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the second half of the talk and answer questions 17 to 20. Now it's time to talk about the wellness calendar. It's called a wellness calendar because it's designed to keep you well. And so we have things like the achievement check, where you come in to record how far you've walked or run in the last week. Some people have gone for miles and miles. If you walk three times around the mall, you will have traveled a kilometer. The management of the mall really encouraged us to walk in here. It's safe in all weather. They even let us have this meeting room as a community service. Uh, back to the calendar. The blood pressure screen will be here on Monday the 5th, and it will be at 10 a.m. This is probably a good time for most people, so come and be checked. Oh, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, that's wrong. The team will arrive at 11. Sorry. Access is the exercise class we hold in the mall. It's gentle exercise, but I think you'll find it'll do you a lot of good. The instructor will help find the correct level of exercise for you. Finally, the health visitor this week is Dr. Sally Long, and she is going to talk about ways to get a good night's sleep. I hope we'll see lots of people at her presentation on Wednesday the 14th. So stay well. I'll see you again soon. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a tutor, Dr. Lester, and two students, Greg and Alexandra, at the end of a talk about music. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about some of the students' favorite instruments and favorite styles of music. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. I think it's time we looked at the results of our survey. Uh, what did you find out, Alexandra? We're a group with very diverse tastes, Dr. Lester. Hmm, I'm not surprised. What were the favourite instruments? Well, Greg loves drums. He told me he played drums when he was at primary school, and now he plays drums with his friends at weekends. They have a band. Hmm, good. Uh, what do you like to play, Alexandra? My favourite is a guitar. However, I haven't played for years, so I keep hoping to start again. Will I go on with the others? Hmm, yes, please. Katya is like Greg. She loves to listen to drums. She says she's not a player, just a listener. Rachel, as you know, is a violinist, so of course it's natural that she should favour the violin. Hmm. So we have two people who love the sound of the drum and two who like strings. Uh, the violin for Rachel and the guitar for Alex. What does Harry like? Harry says the best instrument of them all is the piano. He claims it's more versatile than any other instrument. Emiko plays a piano, but her favourite instrument is the flute. The flute? Yes, Emiko plays the flute too, of course. Hmm, thank you. Alexandra. Uh, Greg, will you tell us the students' favourite style of music? We're really very conservative. My favourite is classical music, and that's Alexandra's choice too. Katya claims to like rock. So that's a vote from Greg, Alexandra and Katya. Does Rachel prefer classical music? Rachel made a choice which surprised me. She plays the violin. So I expected classical or opera, but Rachel says that she prefers country music. Hmm, how interesting. What's Harry's choice? Harry likes to listen to opera and loves to go see a performance. He says opera has everything, colour and spectacle and theatre and great music. And Amico? Amico says jazz is her favourite music. She goes to listen to jazz every Friday evening. She also likes opera, heavy metal, classical, but jazz is the best. Thank you, Greg. I wanted to see what you all liked so I could understand your musical tastes more, and I want to move from this to a discussion of the psychological effects of music. In the second part of the discussion, Dr. Lester will talk about the way music affects our bodies. Look at questions 25 to 30 first. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to divide music roughly into two types. Music which stimulates us, and music which calms us. It seems that music which stimulates us gives rise to actual changes in our bodies. We listen to exciting music, and our hearts beat faster, our blood pressure rises, and our blood flows more quickly. In short, we're stimulated. Soothing music, however, has the opposite effect. We relax and let the world go by. 
our heart beats more gently, our blood pressure drops, and we feel calm. Um, Alexandra, can you think of things which help us to relax? Um, gentle rhythms? Yes, in part. The melodies which help us to relax are smooth flowing and often have repeated rhythms. These rhythms are constant and dynamic, a little like the crash of the sea on the beach. Their very predictability is sedating, relaxing. By contrast, very loud discordant music with unpredictable rhythms and structures excites and stimulates us. These two generalizations about the differences between music which stimulates and music which soothes are true as far as they go, but they are far from conclusive. We still have a lot of research to do to find out what, uh, for instance, people of different cultures hear and feel when they listen to music. This department is taking part in a continuing study on the influence of culture on musical perception, and we'll talk about that more next week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a talk about preventative medicine, specifically how students can look after their own health. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning. I'm Dr. Pat Parker, and I'm here to talk to you about preventative medicine in its widest and most personal aspects. In other words, I'm here to tell you how the patient should wrest control of their health away from the practitioners of medicine and take charge of their own medical destiny. I want to talk about staying out of the hands of the doctor. When the patient takes responsibility for her or his own health, and let's decide the patient is male for now, men are in fact more at risk than women anyway, when the patient takes over his own health regime, he must decide what he wants to do. The first thing, of course, is to give up the demon nicotine. Smoking is the worst threat to health, and it's self-inflicted damage. I have colleagues who are reluctant to treat smokers. If you want to stay well, stay off tobacco and smoking in all its manifestations. Our department has recently completed a survey of men's health. We looked at men in different age groups and occupations, and we came up with a disturbing insight. Young men, particularly working class men, are at considerable risk of premature death because of their lifestyle. As a group, they have high risk factors. They drink too much alcohol. They smoke more heavily than any other group. Their diet is frequently heavy in saturated fats, and they don't get enough exercise. We then did a smaller survey in which we looked at environmental factors which affect health. I had privately expected to find air or water pollution to be the biggest hazards, and they must not be ignored. However, the effects of the sun emerged as a threat which people simply do not take sufficiently seriously. Please remember that too much sunlight can cause permanent damage. Given this information and the self-destructive things which people, particularly young men, are doing to themselves, one could be excused for feeling very depressed. However, I believe that a well-funded education campaign 
will help us improve public health standards and will be particularly valuable for young men. I'm an optimist. I see things improving, but only if we work very hard. In the second part of the talk, I want to consider different things that you as students can do to improve your fitness. So now I'd like to issue a qualification to everything I say. People will still get sick and they will still need doctors. This advice is just to reduce the incidence of sickness. It would be great if disease were preventable, but it's not. However, we have power. In the late 80s, the Surgeon General of the United States said that 53% of our illnesses could be avoided by healthy lifestyle choices. I now want to discuss these choices with you. You should try to make keeping fit fun. It's very hard to go out and do exercises by yourself, so it's wise to find a sport that you like and play it with other people. If you swim, you can consider scuba diving or snorkeling. If you jog, try to find a friend to go with. If you walk, choose pretty places to walk or have a reason for walking. Your exercise regime should be a pleasure, not a penance. The university is an excellent place to find other people who share sporting interests with you. And there are many sports teams you can join. This unfortunately raises the issue of sports injuries. And different sports have characteristic injuries. As well as accidental injuries, we find repetitive strain injuries occurring in sports where the same motion is frequently performed like rowing and squash. The parallel in working life is repetitive strain injury which may be suffered by typists or other people who perform the same action hour after hour, day after day. In this context, therefore, the most important thing to remember before any sport is to warm up adequately. Do stretching exercises and aim at all times to increase your flexibility. Be gentle with yourself and allow time to prepare for the game you have chosen to play. Don't be fooled by the term warm-up, by the way. It's every bit as important to do your warm-up exercises on a hot day as on a cool one. I think one of the most sensible and exciting developments in the reduction of injury is the recognition that all sports can borrow from each other. Many sports programs are now encouraging players to use cross-training techniques. That is, to borrow training techniques from other sports. Boxers have been using their cross-training for years, building up stamina by doing road work and weight training while honing their skills and reflexes. Other sports which require a high level of eye-hand coordination are following this trend. So you see table tennis players running and jogging to improve their performance and footballers doing flexibility exercises which can help them control the ball better. All of these results are good, but the general sense of well-being is best and is accessible to us all, from trained athletes to people who will never run 100 metres in less than 15 seconds. Good health is not only for those who will achieve athletic greatness. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.